And I guess I want to start with, and this is something that you must get asked a lot, and it's something I ask a lot, uh, and that is, we went through a crisis, uh, and often what happens when a, a catastrophic event occurs is that we reverse engineer so that it doesn't happen again. So you get great earthquake-proof buildings and earthquake zones. Have we done that? Uh, Jillian, I'd like you to start. A lot of talk, sound and fury, about fixing it so it doesn't happen again. Could we have another financial crisis like the one that froze credit markets for a period of time again? Well, I think that the regulators and governments do have a long history of always fighting the last war. And if you look back at most of the periods of excess and craziness, it's often been in reaction to a previous bubble of some yep. sort that they will clamp down. So, I mean, there's a lot to say about what went wrong, and there's a lot to say about the details of how regulators are trying to prevent it happening again, and why I think many of those details are mis misinformed, misguided. But before we do that, I just want to step back for a minute and pick up on something that was very much a theme of this morning's debate about the nature of markets and what we're trying to do with our banking system. Because before I became a financial journalist, I was actually trained as a social anthropologist. I was an academic and did a PhD and then postdoc work. And as a result, I've always been very interested in systems and in ideology and in power structure, and particularly in what some anthropologists call patterns of cognitive dissonance, or what others might call the bullshit index. <laughs> and, you know, I actually did my field work um, out in Central Asia, but it's very useful for looking at Wall Street or the City of London. Because when I dived into the credit markets back in 2005, what I was repeatedly told by bankers, at, at what was their driving rhetoric, their ideology, was that they were involved in a game of free market capitalism. Finance and Wall Street was held up to be the epitome of free market capitalism. But there's a wonderful anthropologist in America called Karen Ho, who's recently been deconstructing a lot of the language that Wall Street uses. And she points out that if you go back to Adam Smith, what, what was capitalism when it first developed as an idea? And it was basically about small family firms where you had essentially ownership and management overlapping, so interests overlapping, free access to the markets, real competition, and free prices. So you actually had a proper market. And the huge irony that's hung over the financial system for the last decade is that actually, if you look at Wall Street, you have none of that. You've had none of that. You had shareholders of big banks to pick up on Roger Martin's excellent presentation that were not really owners in any effective way. You had markets who were often cartels because the big boys dominated. You didn't often have free prices, ironically. And so much of the financial innovation that I wrote about in my book, which was carried out in the name of free markets, and in fact the buzzword that was very fashionable in a lot of the financial circles when I was writing this stuff was market completion. This idea that if you could liquefy assets, you could trade them and have the perfect free market. It was, to put it crudely, utter bullshit. Because just to take one example, CDOs, which were created in the name of market completion, became so complex that by 2006, it was impossible to trade them. So much so that there were no market prices. The banks and the hedge funds had to use models to price them. There were no real markets. And yet everyone carried on talking about market-based finance. So the question going forward now, before people even start asking, what about Basel III? What about Dodd-Frank? What about the details? Is Are we actually going to try and create a proper market-based financial system or are we going to create a system which is riddled with moral hazard, where essentially the losses are socialized and the gains are privatized? And frankly, the way we're going right now, I think we are. Joe, to me, one of the most dramatic moments uh, post-crisis was watching Alan Greenspan testify uh, before Congress. And Alan Greenspan, along with Larry Summers and Arthur Levitt, arguably were part of the triumvirate that were the biggest adherents of the market should be the market, and it will correct itself. And Greenspan said, in answer to a question, how did you not see this coming? Uh, essentially, he said, I assumed that the banks would self-correct, that they wouldn't actually put themselves out of business with risky behavior. I was wrong. He used the words, I was wrong. It was flabbergasting. He, st he since recanted his recant. Is that right? <laughs> in, in the pages of the FT, he wrote a wonderful op-ed right. recently, essentially right. saying, 
I was wrong to say I was wrong. Fabulous. <laughs> well, I, I, I have a Japanese double negative. I recently <laughs> talked to Larry Summers and asked him, do you think you were wrong? Uh, and he also doesn't think he was wrong. Uh, but Larry do... Summers has never thought he's ever been wrong about anything. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But if, in terms of what Jillian is saying, these were supposed to be the guardians to make sure that however free it could be, especially where overlapping interests are concerned, that we would actually have some kind of checks. They did not do the jobs they were supposed to do. Um, don't get me started. I mean, I could talk for an no, hour get, about get this. No, get started, this, this is, uh, It's your birthday. I, I find this... Um, <laughs> when you go back and look at what the regulators actually did pre-crisis, it is infuriating. It is simply infuriating. Um, I, I hope we wind up actually talking more about what they've done recently because I think in yeah. terms of going forward that's more important. But let's just stop and think about it for a second. Um, <clears throat> The bank regulators, uh, uh, on, tw on more than 20 occasions, um, stopped states and local communities that were trying to uh, say that there's a problem with predatory lending, there's a problem with subprime lending, it's destroying our communities, we need to do something about it. Uh, and they passed laws, local laws, saying this has to, certain kind of abuses have to stop. In every single case, the nation's bank regulators basically preempted national banks from these rules, therefore, thereby mooting them. Instead of saying, huh, the fact that 20 communities or 20 states think there's a problem here, maybe we ought to look and see if there is a problem. Because the, the, the banking, the regulatory view was that whatever the banks want is good for the banks, and that safety and soundness, if it means they have to sell abusive loans, well, too bad. Greenspan, um, in his own memoirs, which fortunately for those of us who've looked at it afterwards were published before the crisis, so it's a little more unvarnished, freely admits that he came to his job as the chairman of the Federal Reserve with uh, not just an anti-regulatory bias, but as a libertarian who did not fundamentally believe in the value of regulation. And he, said, he says in his memoirs, well, I would leave that to other people. And yet he was such a god for so long that everybody gradually fell in line with his ideological view. So what does that mean in terms of the application to the Fed? Well, the Fed actually does have two jobs. One is monetary policy, and the other is as a supervisor of the bank holding companies in the United States, a job that they just opted out of. It, is Greens it was Greenspan's view which defies human, it just defies belief because it's so contrary to what you see in daily life. It was Greenspan's view that a, a bad guy, a bad player, a bad participant in the market would be in effect um, ostracized by the other players in the market and would therefore lose business and would become a good player. That's, that is how he, it, but of course exactly the opposite happened both on Main Street with subprime companies and on Wall Street with the investment bank, which is that what Greenspan thought would be a race to the top became in fact a race to the bottom. The subprime world is the easiest place to see this because what happened in the subprime world is that any subprime company that tried to have some standards of underwriting lost loans and lost business to companies that had lower standards and less underwriting. So ultimately, everybody had to do liar loans or did liar loans. And everybody had to do these various loans that layered risk upon risk upon risk. And, and, ugh, I, I, <laughs> all right, that's what happened. That is what happened.